thank you for thank you for your introduction, Renee. Um, you actually summarised a lot of my points. I can probably do my presentation in ten minutes, and then we can uh, take a Q and A session thereafter. Um, I think you're right in 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 making the point that um, first of all, you know, there are so many F L and G conferences a year now that if I wanted to, I could just travel around the world and and do presentations. Uh, secondly, I think a lot of the the focus of the F L and G industry uh, or on floating liquefaction has changed and has changed a lot towards um, what I would say is medium scale F L N G. What I'm going to do today is touch a bit upon what Flex is doing, um, but I'm also going to try to, to lift this up to, um, um, to a higher level and say, what is it that we're seeing today, and how do we believe this will impact the LNG industry going forward? Um, because I think the way the LNG industry has been developing, uh, the way lots of the onshore projects have been developing, uh, in the long run is not sustainable, um, because you're now seeing continued cost pressures onshore, and if we are in a, um, in, in a longer term environment, maybe not going to have oil prices at, at $100 even. Today it's 90, I think Brent is 90 today or 91. Um, how are we going to get more LNG to the market? Quick introduction of Flex, and then I'll um, go in and use um, what we've been doing in, in PNG as a, as a quick example, and then touch a bit of, uh, upon um, the the technology that we've, uh, that we've chosen, uh, and also, as I say, try to put that into a higher context as to why we believe um, that is, is, is helpful for the LNG industry in, in, in breaking some of the vicious cycle uh, of cost increases it's in today. Flex LNG was founded in 2006. Uh, we are focusing uh, purely on floating liquefaction, a uh, real listed company. And we're working uh, with Samsung. I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, some of our slides before um, summarizing that. Um, the first FLNG project is in PNG. Uh, we have their uh, completed feed, which we completed in uh, February slash uh, January. Um, and we are now awaiting FID for that project, uh, um, which is today uh, somewhat outside of our control, um, given politics uh, which are ongoing in PNG. There's an election there, um, more or less, as we speak. So we expect more clarity there in, in August um, and or September. Um, this project is a bit different than what we um, first, thought, or first thought that FLNG would be uh, four or five years ago. We thought that FLNG would typically be offshore. We'd be monetizing stranded or commercially challenged um, offshore reserves. But in PNG, it's actually a, a, an alongside a jetty application, which is maybe, for those of you who are, who are more familiar with FSIUs, it's quite similar to the way FSIU industry has developed. Uh, floating regas started offshore through Accelerate. Now, more or less, all of them are being developed uh, alongside a jetty. I'm not saying all FLNG projects will be like that, but it just shows the versatility that once you've got something that floats, you can actually move it around, and it becomes a lot more flexible than what you initially thought. Cost increases are unfortunately uh, not being terribly helpful for the onshore uh, liquefaction industry, which again for FLNG is pretty good, um, because if you're looking at this um, graph over here, which is Sarah's um, UCCI index, you're basically seeing that uh, around Lehman, um, we had a, a sharp downturn in, in construction costs onshore. However, it's now moving back up again, and the trend seems to uh, either um, basically be flat or continuing to rise. So for those of you who are closing your eyes and saying onshore will eventually become cheaper again, it doesn't seem that that's going to happen near term or even medium term. What's going to happen long term, five or 10 years from now? I think my predictions are probably as good as yours. But at least medium to near term, or near to medium term, we're not seeing cost pressures onshore coming down, which is quite good for stuff that floats. Of course, we have cost pressures also for the floating industry, uh, whether it's for oil FPSOs, for subsea, for FLNG, etc. But for a number of reasons, and I'll try to uh, highlight some of them later on, we don't seem to be that affected compared to what is going onshore. So if you look at this one down here, it's a bit outdated now, because if we start putting in updated figures for Gorgon, 
uh, GLNG, PNG, LNG, et cetera, the, the, uh, the, the unit cost here is actually higher. Uh, so here we've plotted unit cost, um, so US dollars um, per ton liquefaction capacity, um, so construction costs basically for, for onshore projects. Gorgon is a very large project, initially starting out at 15 million tons. So on a unit cost basis compared to us, which is in the uh, 1.7 to 2 MTPA range, it should be beating us because that's the way the industry has, has, has traditionally been developed. The bigger you go, the cheaper it should be on a unit cost basis. That's not the case today. As I say, there are a number of reasons why that's not happening. Uh, I'll try to highlight some later on, but it is, this is a very important driver for why we believe FLNG is now slowly but surely coming of age. When we um, founded FlexLNG in 2006, uh, we were originally focusing on two areas. One was stranded or associated gas, so to some extent what, uh, what Petrobras is doing, you have an oil, oil field development, you need to evacuate your gas somehow, or you are flaring large amounts of gas today. The other one was your classic stranded gas um, scenario, where you would be producing gas from an offshore gas discovery, um, non-associated gas, and these were the two areas we were focusing on. We soon discovered that actually, you know, associated gas, there's not that many opportunities out there of a scale where there's enough associated gas available. Petrobras, I would say, is a bit of a different animal, um, but apart from that, there aren't that many out there. There are some on much smaller scale, maybe half a million tons, etc. but then your economics, again, start to become a bit more challenging. But what we did, um, did notice is two elements that we never thought of in 2006. One of them was basically saying, what if you've got onshore gas or an onshore gas grid? US is a good example. What if you've got onshore gas? Um, could you then use an FLNG unit to export it, either through a pipeline, which you then take offshore, or through a pipeline that you would use, uh, sorry, that you would, you would use to supply an FLNG unit um, moored in a, in a safe location in a harbor. This is basically the, the layout for PNG, where you have onshore stranded gas, but where the construction costs onshore uh, are so high that you would rather um, have an effluent unit come in and you can accelerate, as Rene uh, mentioned, you can accelerate your cash flow whilst at a later point in time you will then do an onshore development. We didn't think about that in 2006. Don't think many other people did either. And that is actually um, some of the, the more innovative parts of FLNG today are now exactly using onshore gas. We are still looking at a number of you know, your traditional offshore stranded gas fields, but this is no longer the only um, available opportunities out there. Our design, the way we've chosen to do this, and we didn't just end up with this design um, through a, a stroke of brilliance or magic in 2006. Um, we spent about two years landing on it. Uh, we originally started out with a one MTPA design. We then saw that that was not the sweet spot from a unit cost perspective. Given the available technology today, given the available drivers, coal boxes, et cetera, et cetera, we, we scaled it up and got close to 2 million tons, 1.7 to 2 MTPA. Uh, we also initially were doing electric drives, then we went over to direct drives, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been um, at least, I would say, two years of evolution in our design where we, where we were basically growing the design and then we, we stopped once we got closer to MTPA and where we also looked at, at, at smarter ways of doing it. Well, we at least believe it's smarter in, in how we can we can make it even more competitive from a unit cost perspective. And then we've spent the last two years in basically taking uh, that design and more or less perfecting it. Um, doing optimizations, how can we make sure that it is a robust design? <coughs> we have a storage capacity of 170,000 cubes. Um, we can add LPG and condensate to this. Um, fuel shrinkage, this is from the top of the riser to offloading, so this includes boil off gas losses, etc., etc., of a total 10%, which is more or less comparable to an onshore plant. Um, we need feed gas, of course, depending on the inerts in the feed gas, if it's, in feed gas, if it's rich, lean, etc., of 250 to 310 million a day. Uh, we are DNV classed, and we would be offshore uh, plus minus 20 years, or 
uh, in the range of 20 years. This is the generic offshore design we have. What we've been doing for PNG is basically taking this design, um, optimizing it, simplifying it, and then making it, um, it fit for a, a, a jetty application. So we now have basically two generic designs, one for offshore and then one uh, which is alongside a jetty. How does this work? Um, very quickly, the gas would come in, uh, once again this is the offshore design, uh, the gas would come in through the turret and inlet systems. Here you would then have uh, pretreatment systems where you will basically uh, use so-called field specific modules um, to take the gas down to what you can say from a simplified perspective is down to a pipeline specification. So that is more or less similar to what you would pull out of a grid anywhere in the world. Then you have treated gas that goes into your generic modules where you have also um, generic pretreatment to, to take the CO down, um, down to 50 ppm, etc., etc., and then you go in um, into the liquefaction. Um, so we, we are trying to keep as much as standardized as possible. Um, there is no such thing in the world today as a generic FPSO, and if it is, then it re isn't really optimized and it's quite expensive. Uh, so what we've done is, yes, for every project, you need to adapt it. There needs to be changes made. Most of those changes will be made here. There might be some tweaks here as well, but on a, on a, on a high level scale, we're trying to keep as much of it um, unchanged from one project to the other. That gives you a, a schedule um, advantage, gives you a capex advantage, and also makes the shipyard more happy because then they, they, then they can replicate what they're doing from one to the next. Showing the same again, um, but basically just, just illustrating it um, in a different way, where you have field-specific modules uh, down here where you would remove large amounts uh, of CO2, uh, maybe re-injected if you need as well, uh, MEG potentially, uh, nitrogen rejection, uh, you'd have um, inlet separation here, uh, LPG handling, um, etc. So once again, uh, you have a design where you are largely dividing it in two, uh, one of it you can, you, you can see is sort of the, the front end treating of the gas. And then once, once that has been completed, you then go into to, to your liquefaction part of the module where you have the fine treatment of the gas, but where you are um, not doing any of the um, removal of large amounts of CO2, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned previously that FLNG, up until a couple of years ago, uh, in our minds as well, was largely seen as something that you would do offshore. Your gas discovery would be offshore, whether it was associated gas or, um, or dry gas, or, um, sorry, and your location would be out of sight, out of mind, offshore. Uh, to some extent, where regas started plus minus 10, 10 years ago. Today, more or less, all, re all regas projects are in harbors alongside a jetty. This is an example uh, which shows that it doesn't have to be like that. Um, this is what um, we are doing in PNG, together with Interoil and Pacific LNG. They have an onshore discovery, which is plus minus 100 kilometers from the coast. You can say that doesn't sound too bad. That is true. In, in PNG, it's actually not that bad. Uh, compared to the PNG LNG project, which is a much challenging terrain to go through, Interoil's location, uh, proximity to the coast, etc., is not too bad. You have large gas reserves here. You will have a condensate stripping plant, which will take out the condensate upstream. Um, so basically, you will be receiving more or less dry gas down to the coast. Condensate will be received, sorry, will be removed uh, at, at the well site. Then you have dry gas coming down to the coast. A pipeline taking it down to the coast with marine infrastructure and then an FLNG unit. So why would they be going for FLNG also looking at onshore? Several reasons for it. Uh, the main reason, however, is driven by cash flow and is driven by development timelines and simplicity of actually developing it in, in such a way. PNG is a challenging environment to do any development in. Um, this is in the Gulf province where there is um, literally no infrastructure from before. So you basically have to start from scratch at whatever you're doing, whether you're doing a minerals project, you're doing an oil project or a gas project. In this case, um, they anyway have to develop the, uh, the upstream, they anyway have to take out the, the condensate, and they have to build a pipeline. 
the big thing that, or the big element here which they do not have to do immediately is relate to the onshore liquefaction. And hence, you can bring in an FLNG unit which is built in a controlled environment at Samsung Heavy Industries, and hence you can also then uh, accelerate your cash flow by a number of years and on a much lower, lower risk profile. For an FLNG unit for such a project, uh, what is Flex LNG scope, or what would a typical FLNG scope be, and what would the scope be for, for, um, for the upstream sponsors? We are bringing in the FLNG unit, which is a completely self-contained unit. We have all the power generation on board. We, we're not relying on anything else but actually receiving feed gas. The only thing we need is feed gas. We have power generation on board. We have accommodation on board. We will have tugs that, br that, that bring us supplies, etc., etc. We have LNG storage. LNG offloading will be done conventionally over here. But basically, you are looking at a completely self-contained unit which, as I say, only needs feed gas. So you're not actually uh, at the end of the line of logistics when it comes to receiving power from a power plant onshore, cooling water, anything like that. We are completely self-contained, which means that the only thing we really need is marine infrastructure and gas, and then we can go. I mentioned previously that we've, we've simplified the design um, compared to the offshore design we had. Um, however, the, the core um, stays more or less the same in the sense that we are still producing close to 2 MTPA. We have 170,000 cubic meters of storage. We are still using a dual um, N2 expansion train uh, on, a, on a parallel train basis. Uh, in this case, we're receiving pipeline quality feed gas. Uh, there is some CO2 in there, there's some captains, some H2S, etc. But it is, it is largely, um, largely dry feed gas uh, that we're, we're receiving and permanently moored to a jetty. Here you can see the elements that we're removing. We're taking away propulsion because we no longer need that given that we're permanently moored. We're removing a genset. Turret is, of course, coming out. Uh, we're receiving. Uh, sorry, we are removing most of the field-specific modules. Condensate storage is being minimized. There's a bit of plant condensate we need to handle, and also removing condensate offloading. So compared to the, the, the offshore design, it's a shorter uh, version of the FLNG unit. But as I say, the, the core, uh, to a large extent, remains the same. This is your barge type um, FLNG unit. Um, our offshore design has a length of 336, so you can see it's been shortened. Um, the breadth is, is, is the same. Uh, the depth is more or less the same as well. Uh, draft is plus minus the same. So you have a lot of the, la um, the same parameters here, but it is, it is basically shorter and also, um, to some extent, a, a, a simpler design and hence a lower capex design. Uh, here, we're probably saving in the range of 100 to 200 million dollars compared to an offshore design. Once again, um, just to show the simplicity here, you bring in an FLNG unit, you're receiving pipeline gas, and that's basically it. You will then have your LNG carriers will come alongside um, and will then take it to the market. We could also do side-by-side do -side offloading. But unfortunately, uh, most LNG um, buyers today remain fixated and remain quite firm that they're not terribly happy with side-by-side -side offloading, which is fine. That's a perception issue that just needs to be, be worked over time. And hence, you will have traditional offloading. But there is, there, there is nothing stopping us from actually doing side-by-side -side and hence saving a bit on the infrastructure cost. But from this perspective, that's not really critical from a, from a CapEx perspective. For those of you who have been to uh, or have been looking at floating regas, you will see that what you're doing here is just the complete opposite. Floating regas, you would bring in a ship with LNG. You would have a regas ship on the other side of the jetty. You would then turn the arrows. You would be receiving LNG across the jetty head, and then you would be regassing it and sending gas into the grid. Here you are just reversing the process. Rene mentioned um, early cash flow for large, large gas fields out there. Uh, here we've just shown that you can 
you know, for PNG or any other place, you can actually expand it by just adding more units. Um, a couple of years ago, we were asked to do uh, feasibility studies for basically two large gas field developments. And then you would say, well, if you've got a lot of gas, why wouldn't you then either go for a very big FLNG unit, and I'll touch upon the capex implications of going big of FLNG later on, or actually build a traditional onshore train? Well, many reasons. It might be that you haven't defined your field yet. You might have discovered a lot of gas, but you're not sure if you've got 3, 5, 10, or 15 TCF. Um, it might be that you are going to have a, for a number of reasons, that you are going to have a long ramp-up period. So you might have a two, three, four year ramp up period, as I say, for a, num for a number of reasons. Hence, building a lot of infrastructure um, at an early part, onshore, uh, at an early part of the field development is not going to be optimal, but it might be optimal from an FLNG perspective where you can add one unit and then two or three years later you can add another one. Or it might be that you have a limited plateau life and you have a very long tail for the field. Uh, I, th I think Arun is, is a good example. Arun has been a successful you know, LNG development for decades, but it's also had a very long tail life of the field. Uh, if Arun was developed as an FLNG project using multiple units, and I'm just using Arun as an example because it would have never been developed that way, of course, given, given history, but if you have a long tail for a field, whether it's five or ten years, and you have a lot of capacity built on shore, and that is your only uh, source of, of gas supply, then for, for the last five or 10 years, you're going to have a lot of redundant capacity that you cannot use. For FLNG, you could, you could remove units gradually as your, your tail starts to come down. So the number of reasons for why you might want to look at using FLNG, whether it's early cash flow or it has to do with the characteristics of the, of the discovery and the, um, the, uh, the proving up you're, you're currently doing or some of the production characteristics of the, um, of the field itself. When we, um, when we set up FlexLNG in 2006, uh, one of the key uh, drivers for us was if you're going to do something new in the LNG industry, which is a very conservative industry, how do you make sure that it is structured in the correct way? Um, we soon landed on the conclusion that partnering with the shipyard at an early part of, of your development is important because FLNG is, is so new that the banks are skeptical, and this was pre-Lehman, post-Lehman, it's even worse. Uh, the banks are very skeptical when it comes to technology risk on FLNG. Once there are 5, 10, 15 FLNG units in operations, they will start to treat them more like oil FPSOs, where they will take the view that mm, we're actually quite happy with the redeployment risk, we're quite happy with the technology risk, and hence we're willing to also take an exposure towards maybe um, you know, asset values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, they will purely look at an FLNG unit as a cash flow generating machine. They won't want to take any residual value exposure. And given that it's a very expensive bit of kit, whether it's costing 1.5 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 billion, depending on how, how big you build it, the banks will also look at someone to take the technology risk. What happens if it doesn't work? You've built a nice bit of kit, it's taken offshore, and it doesn't work. You have to take it back in, whether it's into Singapore to do emergency repairs, or you go back to the yard, et cetera, et cetera. You have one and a half billion dollars, maybe two, maybe three billion dollars of kit, and it doesn't work the way it should be. Um, today, I would argue there's not a single service provider in the, the floating space that has actually a balance sheet, whether it's SBM or Modec or some of the really big oil FPSO players out there, and I know there's a MODEC representative here today, so there's no, I have, I have no, in, no ill intentions toward MODEC. It's just a pure recognition that these units are so expensive that you need someone to take the technology risk. And today, the way technology risk is taken in all FPSOs, you cannot transfer that to FLNG. So you end up saying, who is actually going to make sure that the top sides and the hull work the way they were designed to work and everyone intended them to work? Well, you've basically got a couple, of, um, a couple of alternatives. Either the shipyard needs to say, we are going to put our balance sheet, our reputation, and our entire, basically, corporation behind this, and we're going to make sure it works. 
Or you can do it basically the shell route, where you say we are shell or we are someone else with a very big balance sheet, and you say, you know, if this thing doesn't work, it doesn't really matter because we have a massive balance sheet to stand behind it. We will work it out over time. It might take six or 12 months, but it's not going to bankrupt us. Or you need the upstream owner, if this is in a more, in a more lease scenario, and it's, it's not a shell, but it's someone else. Or you need the upstream owner or an off-taker, LNG off-taker, utility in Japan or Korea or China, et cetera, to stand behind it and say, you know, that's fine. We will actually help take some of the completion guarantee here. What we decided to do was we um, worked with Samsung, uh, where we have a strong EPC IC contract. Samsung is by no means taking all of the technology risk here. But if something does go wrong, then the, then the, the definition is very clear. Who is responsible? And in this case, there are no, there are no gaps to fall between. There's no, uh, no one can point a finger at the other and say, we don't really know if it's the hull or the top sides. Samsung provides a turnkey responsibility and says, we're going to provide a unit that works. Of course, there are you know, certain thresholds in there, et cetera, et cetera. But this, we know, is bankable because we have been around to a number of banks, to ECAs, et cetera, and they are happy with such a structure. So bankability and the contract particulars with the shipyards are very, very important, given the, the novelty that industry sees and also given the, the capex involved. We've chosen to work with Samsung. Um, there are other, you know, other companies have chosen to work with DSME or with HHI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whether it's Samsung or DSME um, or HHI, the, the point is more that they have existing infrastructure that has been built, that is, that is you know, fit for purpose and that that does one thing and one thing only, they build stuff that floats. Yes, they also build you know, top sides for, for, uh, for fixed platforms, et cetera, but largely they build stuff that floats, whether it's container ships, LNG carriers, drill ships, FPSOs, et cetera, et cetera. And they do it very well. They build maybe an average 40 to 60 floating units a year, so that's something they do extremely well. Why is this important? Because this is one of the key drivers for why we believe FLNG is currently more competitive than onshore LNG. If you're building an onshore LNG project, whether it's in Australia or PNG or in Mozambique or wherever it's going to be, you are likely to be in a part of the world where there is little or no infrastructure from before. And for Australia, you're also in a part of the world which is heavily unionized, which has um, very expensive labor, et cetera, et cetera. But you are largely going to be in a part of the world or a part of the country where there is very little infrastructure. So you will have to build a small city to house your workers. You will have to build a port. You will have to build an airstrip. You will be flying in crew, you know, fly in, fly out, etc., etc. All of this you need to do for every LNG project you build. Samsung has already done that. DSME have already done that in the sense that they have built basically their own city. And they've done that over three or four decades. So. Everything that you basically need to build, whether it's in Australia or Mozambique or a PNG, which is not related, only related to logistics, not related to your actual uh, construction of your LNG project, you can remove from the equation of FLNG. Because that is already done by the shipyard from before, and you are building it all in a controlled environment, which also gives you better control over, over schedule and we believe will also give you a significantly lower capex because it is easier to manage the risk. I spoke to a guy from, um, from one of the Australian projects. I won't mention which company, but it's an Australian project which started up only a couple of months ago, so you probably know which one it is. Um, and he said that for the LNG project that they were developing, he said that for, I think, the, the, the total capex came in at about 15 billion uh, once they'd done a couple of re revisions. He said that three to four billion of that capex alone has got nothing to do with the LNG plant. It's got nothing to do with anything that produces any cash flow. That is purely flying in, flying out people. That is purely building accommodation for people. It's, it's building an airstrip. It's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you are adding a lot of capex to a project 
which is not generating any cash flow and will never generate cash flow, which is purely there to facilitate constructing a, a, a facility. The yards have already done that, hence FLNG um, is more competitive and we're seeing it's more competitive based on pricing that we have now for the PNG LNG project. We've chosen to go, to go for a medium scale FLNG and, and you know, a number of other companies uh, have done the same. Our three drivers here is basically we, we need to minimize capex because FLNG cannot be a nice hobby for a company. It's, it's not gonna be sustainable in this industry if this is a hobby for a company or companies with very large balance sheets, whether it's the majors or the NOCs, and it's purely for engineers so they're allowed to tinker with it. It needs to be a concept that is profitable in its own right and that has a capex which can stack up against large onshore projects. So we are very focused on minimizing capex. We've done that by basically maximizing LNG production within standard LNG hull sizes. Once you go outside of anything that's standard, you, you, you start to add, add cost. And also working closely with Samsung to ensure that this is a, as constructible as possible. Minimize uh, the execution schedule. Uh, we did that by, or we've done that by basically having a generic concept, which you can, which you can tailor in a quite simple manner. Uh, for the, uh, the PNG um, project now, we've done a generic feed before. So we took the offshore feed, turned that into a, um, a, um, a feed, which is now ready to go into detail engineering in basically six months. You couldn't do that if you had to start from scratch um, every, every time around. Also very focused on modularization. Uh, minimize technology and operational risk. Uh, if we have the chance of introducing larger drivers which are not seen as proven by the industry, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we could have done that. But we would then have been outside of the envelope that many of the off-takers, many of the upstream players would have said, we're comfortable with that. So we've actually taken a step back and said, Yes, we could maybe have gone for an even larger driver than what we have today. But we've chosen to say no, we might do that for unit two, three, or four, but for the first unit, we're gonna stay as simple and as proven as possible. And same here, um, select inherently safe and robust technologies. We've gone for the nitrogen expander, uh, nitrogen as, the, um, um, as refrigerant here. Uh, we've chosen to do that for a number of reasons, but one of them is also through, through safety. We're using an inert gas to cool hydrocarbons. We're not using hydrocarbons to cool hydrocarbons. Just to put into perspective as well, what we've done here is we've plotted oil FPSOs, um, which have been, um, been built or in the process of being delivered, and we've, uh, we've taken them along uh, the length axis and also looked at the beam. Here you can see what is currently proven today. And uh, we are, for our offshore design, we are well within the proven range. Why is that important? It's important because once again, you get into constructability, you get into capex, schedule, etc. This is something the shipyards are comfortable with. These designs, which are the large FLNG barges, and one of these is shells, uh, are not proven. And I'm not pointing finger at Shell or anyone else and saying, you know, you're building something that's not gonna work, etc. Of course it's gonna work. Shell know what they're doing. But they also have the luxury of a massive balance sheet and I would say the luxury of time uh, to do this. I think Shell's schedule from FID until, in, until delivery is I think plus minus 60 months. Our schedule from FID until delivery is plus minus 40 months. So there's a big difference there. And that difference comes down to largely because they are building something which is far outside of what has ever been built before. And to illustrate that on a different way, here we're looking at topsides. Topside weight is often a, a good rule of thumb and a good indication of complexity. Um, because, you know, there's, there's some logic to that. The more weight you add to a topside, the more interfaces you have, the more modules you're likely to have, etc. Hence, you have more complexity. What we've done here is, once again, we've plotted what is more or less out there today. There might be one or two FPSOs that we've overlooked here. But you're basically seeing that FPSOs max out currently, all FPSOs max out in the 35 to 40,000 ton topside range. For our design for uh, PNG, 
we are just below 20,000 for an offshore design, we would be above. And if you start adding a lot of CO2, etc., we'd probably be in the 25 to 30,000 ton range. But you're still within what is currently proven out there. If you look at the large FLNG units, um, you are typically doubling what is currently proven. Once again, it can be done. And I'm sure uh, the developers of such projects will, will pull it off, and it's going to work just fine. But by doing that, you are moving the yards outside of their comfort zone. You're moving, you know, everything that you are putting on board is likely to be a one-off. And as soon as you do one-offs, your cost starts to spiral or basically to escalate. And that's what we're, we've tried to do by saying, let's keep it within the medium FLNG range, because then we believe that CapEx will also, and execution schedule, and hence we also believe that if ex execution schedule is, is more within the proven range, then that is also better when it comes to mit mitigating risks. So I'll try to summarize quickly. We've, uh, um, you know, I go to a number of conferences, and one of the main questions is, well, you know, all of this technology is very nice. Your cost comparisons are very nice, but what does this mean for the real world? How can this be of use, and how do you believe this is going to change the industry going forward? Here I've put myself in the shoes of an Asian utility. Let's say you're a Japanese or a Korean or Chinese or wherever you are in Asia, and you are looking at securing long-term LNG supply. You might, all, you might already have been securing it for the last 20, 30 years. And if you take the, the assumption on board that you can not only buy LNG when there's a buyer's market, so you can't just sit around and wait for a Lehman to happen you know, any um, uh, once in a blue moon, and you actually have to go out there and buy LNG, whether it is every year or every other year. So you need a long-term sustainable strategy. And every utility today is complaining about the cost of LNG which is, is natural, and I'm sure they've been complaining about the cost of LNG for the last 30 years. But if you then take the view that how can you as a utility take more control over your own destiny, hence take a, have a great influence on the development of an LNG project, and hence also potentially lower your, your, your landed cost of LNG, you basically have two routes to follow. One, you can go the traditional route, so you can, you can enter into projects which are largely developed by majors or the NOCs, the traditional model, the model that's been out there since, since the 70s. Um, you are likely to be allowed to enter close or at FID. Small stake will be available, uh, might even be below 1%, but typically in the 1% to 5% range. And you realize LNG price, when I say realize LNG price, um, that is not only the price that you're actually paying for LNG, but also, if you are looking at the dividends you're receiving from a project, is likely to be plus minus market price. Or you can say, OK, why don't we try to change, change, change this a bit? Let's see if we can take a, a stake in a project being developed by untraditional LNG players. When I say untraditional, don't think of high risk or you know, dodgy players, anything like that. This is purely players that have not been in the LNG industry for the last 20, 30 years. So outside of the, of the club of five or 10 large players that have typically dominated the industry. You would be most likely allowed to enter, and you'd be encouraged to enter at an early stage, because you would bring, as a large utility, you'd bring credibility to the project. Large stake could be available. Of course, lower than this is available. But you could even be able to push it up to 50% if you wanted to. Um, discount, because you're coming in early and you are providing probably financing and credibility to the project. And you realize LNG price will be at a, in this, uh, in this extent, if, if, if they push this up towards 50%, they will have a significant discount to market price. And I believe, based on discussions we're having, and we know other companies are having, that once you get, let's say, to 2020, which is only eight years from now, which in the LNG LNG sphere is not, is not that long. By 2020, you will see utilities doing this. You will see utilities trying to break the mold and saying, we'd like to take more control of our own supply destiny and actually become our own LNG suppliers. And that's going to be interesting, because then you're going to see a completely different dynamic than what you've got today, which is still largely controlled by the majors and the NOCs. 
To summarize very quickly, um, LNG FPSOs, uh, we believe, offer compelling arguments. Uh, monetizing commercially challenged gas reserves. Um, lead time will be, for some projects, can be uh, less than 50% of what you would for a traditional onshore project. Uh, unit capex, at least for, for Flex's perspective, I can't speak for other companies, is still in the $550 to $700 per ton range. Redeployability, you can't redeploy concrete onshore, but you can redeploy steel that floats. Strategic and commercial independence, um, this is an important element that a lot of people seem to forget. For an FLNG project, because there's less capex invested, there's also less capex to recover. So hence, you're recovering less capex, and your host government is actually making a better return than they are for a large onshore project. And environmental impact. Uh, you're not necessarily disturbing wetlands. You're not doing a lot of reclamation, etc. cetera, for, for land. You are purely doing this, whether it's in a harbor or doing it offshore. And what changes will this have on the industry? Um, LNG supply can, over time, when you have existing FLNG units that can be redeployed, you can have new supply popping up in less than two years. I think regas is a, is, is a good analogy there. You're seeing regas projects now happen in, in, in time frames which were unthinkable previously for onshore um, um, regas. Um, supply projects in locations unimaginable today. Maybe five years from now, you will see uh, LNG being exported from Europe. I don't know, but no one would have thought that the uh, US would have exported LNG three or, three or four years ago, and they haven't yet, but is, it is looking increasingly likely that, that they will. Onshore liquefaction projects will have to innovate and change. Uh, I don't think the, the current cost escalation, the current cost base is sustainable. It has to change. Something's got to give somewhere, and I can't predict what it's going to be, but something's got to change. Companies with no affiliation can become large LNG suppliers. Once again, you shouldn't think of untraditional LNG companies here as being, as being high-risk companies. It's purely players who previously haven't been in the industry. And going back to my end user example, I think you're going to have utilities which are going to take control of their own destiny. They're going to say, enough of this, this boys club. We want to break out of it, and we want to move upstream, not necessarily become an upstream player, but to take a larger control over our own supply destiny. Thank you.